morning to all of you. Thirty-five years ago, as a second-year theater student at Tel Aviv University, I went with my friend Jeanette Malkin for a month to London, a necessary pilgrimage site for every theater student. We went to the theater every night. We did not miss any matinee. Then someone suggested we should go to Stratford-upon-Avon to see Peter Brook's Midsummer Night's Dream at the Royal Shakespeare Company. We went there, and my life was never the same. <laughs> yes, the name Peter Brook was already known to us. We saw the films King Lear and Marasat, and thanks to our teachers at Tel Aviv University, we knew chapters of The Empty Space by heart. But no description prepared me for the magic I witnessed, for the intensity of the performative language of the stage, for the power of movement, gesture, rhythm, and sound. I was not a spectator watching a performance, but a young woman experiencing the mystery of love and life to its fullest. The performance never left me nor the feelings it generated in me. 35 five years and many book performances later, I am truly thrilled as the chair of the theater department to have met and to be able to introduce to you this important director and charismatic man whom Michael Cousteau, his biographer, described as one of the great directors who shaped 20th century theater in a line with Stanislavski, Craig, Meyerhold, Arto, and Grotowski. It is with great pleasure and respect that I welcome Peter Brook, the Dan David Laureate for the di di Dimension of the Present, as guest of honor to the Theater Department and the Faculty of the Arts. I welcome also Gabby and Dan David, who honor us by their presence and whose generosity is the source of this happy event. Another guest we have with us today is, Mas is Michael Costo, Brooks' biographer. I am delighted he could come to share his special meeting, this special meeting with us. I invite Professor Fadi Rokem, the Dean, to greet our guests in the name of the faculty. in performing arts, the present dimension, Mr. Peter Brook. <laughs> to Gabriela David, whom I know is behind a lot of very good things, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. <laughs> to Nuri Diari, Chair of the Tel Aviv University Department of Theatre, Colleagues, students, friends, welcome. For more than 60 years, starting in 1943, Peter Brook has filled stages all over the world with images, actions, and movement, and most important of all, meaning, a lot of meaning. You have taught us what a theater can be, convinced us that it is important, even essential, in order to understand ourselves and the world around us. Your most important achievement, at least for me, is your ability to show us that the chaos and the madness of the world can be healed by the creative energies of the theater and of art, the actors on the stage. To be a true artist like you means to be a realist and an optimist at the same time an almost impossible combination, but you have proved, I think, that it can be done. The first sentences of your book, The Empty Stage, I can take any empty stage and call it a bare stage, empty space and call it a bare stage. A man walks across this empty space 
while someone else is watching him. And this is all that is needed for an act of theater to be engaged. These words are, st are still and will remain the beginning of everything we will say and think about the theater and its magic. Thank you, Peter Brook. In closing my short remarks, I want to greet all the students from the Department of Theater Studies at Tel Aviv University who are here today. I am sure that this will be a unique experience for you all and for us. So I want to invite Mr. Peter Brook to come to the stage. Then you're just who I need. Yeah. <laughs> because the things you said there, which were very kind and which touched me greatly, at once made me think of a terrible experience I had. Really? <laughs> you see what we mean by theater at once. When I was about 16, I saw a film which I thought absolutely marvelous, and I watched it with admiration, and I cried, and it became my favorite film that I've always referred to. And about, oh, 30 years later, suddenly in a cafe in Paris, I was introduced to the director, who was a famous Hollywood director. So I came up to him, and I said, I want to tell you how much I enjoyed, and it was Myerling, your film Myerling. And instead of seeing a smile cross his face, he looked at me in horror. <laughs> then the horror gave way to deep disappointment. <laughs> and he said, I've made 40 films since then. <laughs> I will answer the same thing. As you know, I saw also the last performance. <laughs> Tierno Bocar. And I could say the same thing. Uh. <laughs> you see, we are here to talk about the art of the present. And there is a perfect illustration of the art of <laughs> turning the past elegantly into the present. Thank you. I was landed with this theme. I didn't ask for it. I was told that I'm to talk about the art of the present. And usually, the first thing I do is to talk about something completely different. But to my astonishment, I can't think of anything better, anything that encapsulated in so few words, really something essential, paradoxical, because really what is the present? We don't know, and yet we have to know. And can we know it without the support of something that you could call art? So that these two vast, vague words put together make a sort of friction, a combustion, that make it a very interesting theme. And curiously enough, as everything comes together in the present, seeing Michael Cousteau, who's already been mentioned so many times, I can see him blushing from here in a pink shirt. <laughs> seeing him at once brings back to me a memory from the distant past that refers directly to the present. We were doing a play about another moment in history when 
the world was being torn apart by a horrible, meaningless, terrifying conflict, which was the war in Vietnam. And in the process of preparing our play, information came to us from many, many different sources, from journalists, from people who traveled to Vietnam, and suddenly one morning, we were brought a little press communique which said that General Westmoreland, who was the commander-in-chief, I think, of the army, or one of the major commanders, had sent out that morning, for that day, his daily instruction to the entire army. And his words were, I wish every soldier today to be 100% human. <laughs> you laugh, because it's comic, and at the same time it's chilling, and it's tragic. And the more you think of it, I think that you can well understand why those words, which struck us at the time, have remained to this day, to the present. Because it raises the deepest questions that are political, social, and relate to the theater inseparably. Because I'm sure that this general, who clearly was a stupid man, or he wouldn't have had the idiocy to formulate himself in this way, was at the same time not a monster, not a beast. There have been generals who have written remarkable works of literature, of poetry, and I'm sure that somewhere inside him was a deeply concerned man recognizing the horrifying activity that had become part of his life and who asked himself this question. And the question really places us in front of something that goes very far. It isn't possible to be a human being without an ideal. And that ideal goes beyond anything one can put into words. Already the ideal put into words loses something of its intensity. And at the same time, one cannot be a human being if one isn't functioning immediately and naturally in the present in life. This is the theme that is there in the center of Hamlet, when Hamlet is asked to kill without tainting his mind. He is put in front of General Westmoreland's dilemma, how to be totally human. That means with a pure, untainted mind, and mind is not just the brain, it is the entire spirit, and at the same time, to be recognizing that at that moment his father has given him a duty. How can those two be reconciled? That is the question of Hamlet, and that, in an inarticulate way, was this general's own question. Now, what one can see, I think it's something on which we should all be very clear, that once someone goes into public life, once somebody becomes a politician, a statesman of any description whatsoever, or a military commander, you have to recognize that your secret ideal is something that at the same time you cannot honor. So that if we look at the statesmen of the world, of the political leaders, we can see that there is not one anywhere at any moment in history who has been able to make declarations of what he wishes and hopes as an ideal without lying in the promises of action that he makes. It's not possible because everyone in charge of a large group of people knows that your life is a life of adjustment and compromise. And all politics of every description are adjustments and compromise. Comes election time. At election time, once again, 
the ideals have to be turned into words and promises. And at the moment that the politician making his speech with a microphone speaks, he believes totally in his lie, otherwise he can't speak convincingly. But in fact, we have to be able to recognize and discriminate between his need, which is legitimate, to express his ideal, his need, illegitimate, to lie to us, to get our support for a program which is hidden, and the simple truth behind it all, which is too complex to be expressed. Once one sees that we are in a shifting world, and at this moment we're in a shifting world of endless adjustment for everyone trying to make an hourly, minute by minute balance between one's own secret aspiration at its highest level and the necessary adjustments to go from point A to point B in one's daily life. One sees that compromise is not a good or a bad word, it is a reality and that endless adjustment is what we all live with. Now how within this can one recognize the need to be a hundred percent human? To say it's impossible is really going against humanity towards negativity which pulls everything downwards. To dream that it's possible takes one into some lofty, unreal sphere. So between them one sees that that wish to be a hundred percent human is something admirable in itself. And at once we see that to go farther with this we need the help of an instrument. Now the instrument is what brings us to the extraordinary possibility of this curious collective form called theatre. Because theatre is an instrument. It is an instrument to which one gives sometimes this very grand name of an art, which I'm always very suspicious of. But it is a very potent and effective instrument in which, because time is short and concentrated, it is possible within an hour or two hours, or even, I'm afraid, in the Mahabharata, a whole night. <laughs> but even the whole night of the Mahabharata was a very short space of time compared with the real source of the Mahabharata which lasted, when read, something like 50 days and 50 nights. Within this concentrated space of time, which I prefer to call an hour, one can go way beyond the world of compromises. One can actually open up either smash in one form of theatre or gently push back barriers of understanding which make it possible for a vast group of people who in themselves couldn't one by one live together and agree together on a desert island for more than an hour. But during that one hour the model of how it is possible within the human organism, within human nature, to be in an infinitely different social, human and inner order than for the rest of the day is given by this form. And so when one sees what is theatre about, one mustn't for one moment get lost in the old questions of is it for too many people, is it something for today or yesterday or for tomorrow. One can only say that at any given moment, anywhere in the world, if a group of people 
to go beyond this quotation from the empty space. It's not just one person looking at one person, but a group of people surrounding another group of people. And they, in a short space of time, can build a utopia. They can build a, a utopia and destroy that utopia. They can penetrate into hidden areas of all forms of existence, from the most metaphysical to the most cr crude, to the lowest, to the highest, all that can be opened in a way that we're incapable of doing in our daily life. And for one moment, that opening is in itself healthy and refreshing, because it enables one to see that the foolish dream of being a hundred percent human is not so foolish. At this moment, science is doing very remarkable things. Science, in its astonishing discoveries of the present, is doing something even more remarkable, which brings us right back to our theme, because science is brilliantly discovering what mankind has known intuitively for many thousands of years. For instance, neurology, which we've been deeply involved in, has begun quite recently to discover an amazing thing, which is that human beings have emotions. <laughs> Perhaps one day they will also investigate laughter. I think that that's, that's on its way. But until, oh, ten years ago, subjectivity subjectivity in the sense of what any one of us is actually experiencing personally was a dirty word in neurology. There's all sorts of contemptuous terms were brought to prove that this was unscientific. And a great pioneer of neurology in Soviet Russia, Alexander Luria, was hounded by his colleagues for daring to be interested in the private feelings of his patients and in developing what he called a romantic science, which was science colored and tempered not only by the feelings of the, of the patients, but the feeling of the doctor in his relationship to the patient. We did a play many years ago about starvation in Africa based on the work of a very unique anthropologist, Colin Turnbull, who was also considered an outsider because in going and living f for months amongst a starving tribe, he dared write in his book of all his feelings of pain of guilt and sometimes of criticism and horror in relation to the situation he was living. And that was considered at that time by his colleagues very unscientific. You go there to record the facts and what your own feelings don't concern anyone. This brings us back to the great new discovery of neurology. But this is very new. Neurology has discovered that there is something called the mirror neuron. That means that in all the circuits of the brain, amongst all the many things that are happening, there is something that's moving, a neuron, that they have named the mirror. Now what does this mean? It means that it has now been discovered with very advanced and incredibly expensive instruments. But if one human being is sitting watching another human being, and the other human being says, oh, a certain neuron lights up in his brain. And the person watching, who at this moment is being tested by an enormous magnetic resonance instrument, exactly the same neuron lights up in his brain, which proves that when an actor acts, the person watching 
can participate in this experience. <laughs> so you will see how astonishing it is that science has at last proved that acting is. Now, this goes a long way. Not, I don't want to take away from this vast and magnificent world of exploration that neurologists are doing. But on the contrary, to show that they have done us a great service in showing that the act of playing something and the act of observing someone who is playing is an enormous act of human participation. But as one person enters more and more deeply into something that comes only from their own deepest subjective experience, going beyond what they think to be their experience into something even farther and even deeper, there can be an instant recognition, an instant understanding, a shared understanding between everyone who is watching. So that when in the 60s there was a great need, rightly, to use the word participation, to say, look at this passive audience that isn't participating, this was misunderstood to mean jumping up on the stage and dancing with the actors. And this was charming and great fun for a time, but it didn't touch on the true meaning of participation. What has happened and what has been a real revolution through the world's theatre in the 60 years that I've been working in it has been the recognition that what was called the legitimate European theatre was a theatre that was so constructed that it became a theatre that did not dare go beyond a certain limit in exploring truth and that the actors were insulated from the audience by the nature of the theatre building, by the nature of the footlights, by the nature of the scenery and that theatre conveyed most of all to the audience sitting in the dark not so much truth but very comfortable emotions and an emotion however strong by itself untempered by something which puts that emotion in its place in relation to other emotions is not a truth it's not a moment of truth and it was because of this constant making the dark silent audience a passive receiver of only what author, director and actor wished them to receive that led to this revolt. This revolt that led to everywhere, theatres coming out of proscenians, sceneries being swept away, a different relation between actor and audience, theatre taking place in non-theatre spaces. All this came from a very simple, absolute necessity that the human contact should be not between great artists and customers, authorities and pupils, but should be shared, shared at every moment in the way that makes the mirror neurons truly active. And that has been the vast change in theatre potential that has brought us to today. And now today, one must see the same question from another aspect. In this little space of time, which is the theatre experience, it is possible, as I said, to go beyond the surface. The first thing that makes this unlike the relationship in psychoanalysis or in 
religious experience between teacher and pupil is that it is not only shared between so-called performer and so-called spectator, but it is collective. And the fact that theatre fundamentally, there are exceptions, but fundamentally is a group, a group of performers and a much larger group which is the audience and the fact that there collectively all the mirror neurons can gradually become one vast identical neuron for the audience and then one vast super neuron for everyone which everyone working in the theatre recognises and knows. One knows as a performer and one knows as an audience but there are those, what one calls, moments of truth. Moment when ah, something is suspended and we all together know that we're touched in the same way and are sharing together as one the same experience. Now, here one can see, I'll make another scientific digression if I may. This is the 100th anniversary of Einstein's great discovery. And Einstein revolutionized world thinking on so many levels. One of the things that's least known about Einstein is his own deep, deep humanity and his profound spirituality which refused to be caught up in any definable religious form whatsoever. But in his work he brought a very new concept which is at the basis of all his discovery in 1905. And his great discovery was that every event that can be recorded by instruments or by mathematics can be observed in the physical world is affected by the fact that there is not only an event but there is also an observer. So that Einstein in a different way brought into physics, into relativity, into his sense of the meaning of time and space, this mirror element that the observer is an essential ingredient, a central part, a living part, and that it is impossible to define completely what comes from inside the observer or outside in what the observer observes. These become one whole. Now, one element that he in all his work didn't allow to enter, although enormously complicated and sophisticated thinking went into all the mathematical theories, the quantum theory, all that came out of his work. One element remained untouched. He, like us all, knew that his own subjective experience wasn't always on one level. When he took his violin, when he listened to Bach, when he was alone in the country or sailing his boat, he knew that his own subjective experience was not the same it was when he was irritated, angry, horrified by the events in the world. He knew that his own experience was always shifting and always shifting from one level to the other, from the low level of anger and argument gradually to a finer purer and more essential level and unfortunately he hadn't the time to bring this further question into his speaking his 
of the observer. The observer is not a constant, but any observer, such as yourselves at this very moment, are in continual turmoil and movement. And sometimes I may say something by chance, by happy chance, that can touch you. And at that very moment, something in your own and our shared collective experience, in fact I can feel it at this moment because the silence between us is ever so slightly different from 30 seconds ago, and it's in this way that one can recognize that as observer, one is constantly rising or falling in the level of one's shared experience. Now, this is perhaps when we talk about the art of the present, is where the present, which in the theater one can recognize more than in any other form, that in the present there is constantly a changing level which even takes one to something which goes again very far in the nature of present-day scientific thought. We all live, and it is generally recognized by mathematicians, in something that can never be reversed, which is the movement of time, the arrow of time that goes forward all the time. What the theatre form teaches us, if we think for just for one moment quietly about the form itself, is that this form shows us that while it has to have a beginning, a middle, and an end, those are all illusions. We watch something, we believe in it, we're involved in it, we're a mirror of it, and at the same time we know that before we came, that space was there. When we leave, the space will be there. And all that has taken place was just a series of images. It wasn't more or less than that. It was an experience. And this experience was in the present and has gone. And that present has gone forever. And that within it, although no theater experience has any validity, unless it is moving forwards with the right rhythm, if it's too slow, it loses us. If it's too fast, it loses us as well. If it moves like music, with the right accelerando, right ralentando, the right moments of suspension, we will be with it all the time. And this is perhaps one of the most difficult and important things one always looks for in rehearsal, to find the right movement. When that movement is right, one has these moments that one can call moments of truth because they're undefinable, but those moments of suspension when in fact, for a second, one sees that even that time movement is an illusion and everything stops. And for a moment everything stops. And in that moment we touch something that we know is true, and yet we can't put into words, and then life takes on again. And I say this only to underline something that I think is more important for me than anything else in the way that one can use or misuse this extraordinary possibility that's given to man called making theatre. And that is to recognize that in the theater we can do anything. All censorship is repellent. All intervention from one person, whether it's the author, the director, the actor, or the group, to say, we 
have something to teach you, we have something to show you, we have a point of view that is right, that is also repellent. We are there to make this vast mirror image in which together we can enter beyond what any single person could think to be the whole picture. And at moments there is the true revolutionary need with laughter and with anger to destroy images. And this is right. This, in certain social situations, is what the theatre is there for. It is there as the only privileged place in which taboos can be broken, what in public life, with the help of all the public lies that have to be made by the generals and the statesmen, all that can be put into its place with derision, laughter, satire, and head-on, violent, passionate attack. That is one of the legitimate roles of the theatre experience. Satire, in the vast sense of the word. The smashing of taboos. But this is a lesser role for this vehicle than the one that really can have its use, can be strictly and specifically useful to human beings, which is to show the eyes wide open the reality of a situation beyond what one thinks one knows, very close to the earth. This is the life that we're all living. And at the same time, showing through these moments of suspension that in fact none of the obstacles, miseries and conflicts have any meaning unless each human being recognizes that what is positive, the absolute ideal, can be touched and can be recognized at the same time. And so a theatre experience that makes an audience leave the theatre angry and frustrated is a weaker use of theatre than one that can arouse passion and anger and at the same time let everyone leave the experience that they have shared with a sense that that ideal but it, the ideal for each person, not in the future, but now, in the present, to know what it means to be 100% human, is real. Well, that's enough. <laughs>
Well, your question is my question. It's one that <laughs> I feel that it's one that's troubled me for years and still do. The problem is that what led me to Oliver Sacks was for many years trying to find what could be the possibility of bringing all that's changing our lives in this vast something called science, which is intoxicating and extraordinary. And so in that way, dramatic and theatrical, how could one bring this into a theater experience? And I started by having meetings and lunches with physicists and mathematicians and talking to them and came up against this endless barrier that you have on the one hand the human being on the whole, not very interesting human beings, rather vain, like all experts, academic experts in one field, and no different from the sort of people that you can find in any drama or comedy about human relations between man and wife and so on. So I, and on the other side, their achievements, which were extraordinary, could only be illustrated on a blackboard or a big television screen, but hadn't, you know, an equation, a mathematical equation, hasn't got flesh and blood. And it was through turning around this question again and again and again that suddenly it was Harold Pinter, in fact, who first gave me a book of Oliver Sacks. And reading it, I saw, ah, here the science what we've just been talking about, the discovery of a neuron, expresses itself not only on a computer screen, but through behavior. And what is theater about? Theater is always carried by human behavior. So the moment that I saw that one could make a play about unexpected, unknown, tragic, comic, fascinating human behavior, what Sachs himself described as inner odysseys of inner mythical journeys to the edge of an abyss, and this revealed by the way people spoke or couldn't spoke, the way they used language normally or abnormally, the way their wish to move in one direction led their body to move in another direction one saw that looking at the person from the outside with compassion, the audience could be like the neurologist who sits in his consulting room and looks at somebody coming through the door and is already making a diagnosis of that person's inner brain movements through what he or she sees coming towards them through the door. Now at that moment it was clear that we could do this. And at the same time, what the man who was there to do is to say, not only does this take one like a neurologist into all the questions of the brain, but it brings us and the audience up to one of the greatest mysteries, which in fact now one sees becomes more and more shared, this mystery of, yes, but what is this? something called the brain. And that's how the man uh, who ended on that very open question. What? How? What is this? What does this mean? A vast opening, which in a sense is what all Greek tragedy aimed to bring its audience to. That last moment of what? And so indeed, maybe today, I mean, we're going into something more and more technological. Somebody will begin to find a way of using technology to give a human dimension. You see? So I would say that it is, for anyone working in the theater, it is a real living question because the theater, everything that is of the present of its time, is 
something that opens questions that perhaps can go farther in the theatre than in lectures, debates, and in, in books. So that I'm with you in saying I share your question. Sorry about my English, but I'll try to ask you. <laughs> uh, you're talking about moment of truth, and uh, it's connect me to Jung. You're talking about psychoanalysis too. Uh, is it, for your opinion, it's uh, connecting to our unconscious archetypes or who are unconscious uh, in this uh, in, in this uh, particular time when it's happened? Or, uh, and the other, uh, the other question is, um, if uh, you are, uh, if, if an artist or a group of artists have to look it every time, have to look for it every time, every single, uh, you know, every, uh, how do you find it in your work? How can <laughs> <laughs> but there again, I could say your question is my question. I wish I do. <laughs> well, once again, we're talking about the art of the present. There's no formula. This has to be reconsidered all the time. That you take, for instance, an old theme, a myth. One knows that a myth is something that go, touches one so deeply that call it the subconscious, call it the archetype, who cares? All one knows is that one can be touched and something in one suddenly is brought into life in the present by the myth. But one can't trust this. But you do a performance, lots of young groups with high ideals, say we'll take some great old legend and we know that this will stir the audience. And we find that the mirror isn't working, that we in the audience sit and say, oh yes, we know that old story, uh, we're not all that convinced, who cares? <laughs> and the myth is not working. And then you say, well then we'll do something immediate. Here, a little door opens. <laughs> We don't know what, and something mysterious is happening. Now that is, there the archetype is really playing its role. Tell us. I was told, I was told that the questions from the audience are not heard in the other rooms. Ah. I that there is a microphone here to, but do you see a microphone? <laughs> Uh, you can use my microphone, but uh, we need a, a longer cable. So there you see a, a myth of the present day situation coming together. And that's really where, what's changing all the time, is to find what we call the f basic common ground in which the audience can feel that they today are involved. And sometimes, at the right moment, the right myth, ah, oh, but that's about us. And at another moment, no, you have to start from half a person coming through half a door <laughs> and complaining that something hasn't been heard. So your question really comes to the fact that this is always changing, must change, must be reconsidered. Who has the microphone? Yeah, I will. I will, oh. uh, no. I will uh, just in a, a moment, uh, in just a moment, I will give you. Uh, <laughs> uh, just a. Uh, I will no, just. Told. <laughs> okay, I will. I was just told, Gabi Rapsnia, that uh, we have uh, here with us, I, I didn't know it, otherwise I would have uh, greeted them before. We have here uh, two other laureates from the Dan David Prize, Professor Whiteside and Professor Rao. And I want to...
And last but not least, uh, Professor Bruce Alberts, who got the PhD, honorary PhD, doctorate from Gandalfin. So now that we know that we have the scientists with us, <laughs> We will, be, <laughs> we will be able to have more questions and, uh, and uh, yes, yes, okay, good. You've spoken, I think, with great uh, clarity about the relationship between humans and humans and the human mind and human mind and the perception and interactions among people. And that's a reality. And there are other interesting realities. One is a reality about the world which is independent of humans. And the second is a reality which has to do with the way in which this previous reality, the independent of human reality, projects through the mind, as you said, onto what we consider experience and intuition. And one of the great problems in science is to find ways of conveying the charm and fascination of these worlds that are either independent of human experience or in some way projected in odd ways on human experience. Do you think that the theater has an opportunity to help in that task? So I had you told me before I started that there was a distinguished scientist in the audience. <laughs> I think that one of the things that one could dispute on another occasion and in a different context is whether there is any way in which the human brain, with all its instruments can even suggest that there is such a thing as a reality beyond it because already that formulation a reality is a projection of human thinking so that that is as I say a question for another day <laughs> a very intimate order but I do think that it does bring up this very very interesting question which if really looked at deeply could help us to understand maybe something of the nature of these terrifying religious conflicts that we're living. And that is that ancient man <coughs> and then less ancient man at certain moments touched on very high levels of understanding and having touched them they wished to convey them to other people and at that moment the only if I dare say scientific way at their disposal was through metaphor and imagery and in the way that today we know that when we talk to small children with total respect for them we use words and images that help them to understand and which we hope they won't take seriously so that when we talk about a fairy or a goblin or a spirit or a ghost or a demon or a devil or God, we are step by step leading them towards a scientific appreciation of the world around them, not literally, but through metaphor. And it's not for nothing that all through the world we find the mystery of creation 
expressing itself in so many thousands of different images, whether it's of an egg or of, the, of a whirling sea, or whether it is of a ladder or a thread coming down from high. There's so many different what we call creation myths. These are all attempts at language, and I think that today one must recognize that in a much more evolved and sophisticated form for audiences prepared in a different way, we can still convey in the theater something that one can recognize through this language of imagery and behavior and interchange between human beings, because that is a language that conveys in a true way half-truths. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. Oh, I, there's no limit to that. No, I think that what no, I think what is very important, and I come back to it, is the end of every theater experience should leave one with a healthy recognition of the unknown and the unknowable, and that's what's healthy. And that's why if you say it's infinitely more complicated, I would say exactly the same thing by saying that eventually one reaches the limit of what one thinks one can know. And that, you know, that point, understanding that, uh, oh, that point, <laughs> we're all challenged by technology. <laughs> Reality and experience is based on, in the world that we, quote, know, close quote, it rests on another reality that probably we can't know. And understanding the charm and wonder of that transformation from the world that we know to smaller and smaller scales where we cease to know it or to larger and larger scales where we cease to know it that we exist in an experience that is a tiny slab of salami in between two large pieces of bread, both of which we can't really understand at all. We could really use help from the theater in this. <laughs> to help us with this enterprise. <laughs> that is really, you couldn't put more Clearly, you see how a metaphor, the salami and the piece of bread, a beautiful metaphor bringing something right down to earth of the theater is to say that that unknowable, which is fascinating and mind-blowing, and the need to be there with a microphone in one hand and a glass of water in the other, have to be brought together, and that is perhaps the one form, because if you look at the other forms of art, the non-collective forms, in front of a great painting, in front of a great cathedral, a magnificent mosque, a beautiful, a, a, a vast Buddha like the ones that the, the Taliban destroyed in Afghanistan, when you stand in front of these works, you do have that moment of suspension when everything normal is blown out of your mind and you are in pure experience. But that is in every one of the forms, even in many forms of music, for the listener, that is personal and individual. And where the theater has, and it's so difficult for us, to live up to this, and we never can, but has, what you say, a function, which is to go beyond that mind-blowing of the single individual, to be for a moment between the two slices of bread, for the gap to be blown open collectively. And that has a real social value.
Um, my question might be related to some of the other questions that were asked uh, right now. Um, it's quite specific. I would like to know if you could please uh, try and uh, expand or explain what exactly uh, you were trying uh, to show or maybe to say in uh, two shows that unfortunately happen to only see them on the television on the Arte channel. I'm talking about the tragedy of Hamlet and uh, Don Giovanni. Uh, in uh, other works I've seen, I happen to understand and accept and believe most of the supernatural creatures, uh, um, ghosts and uh, spirits. But however, I, uh, I understood what was happening concerning, I mean, the ghost of Hamlet's father and the Commandatore, but if you could maybe explain what exactly were you trying to say, or do you think you managed to say it, because maybe the problem was that I didn't see it live, and I saw it as a photograph, maybe there was something you managed to convey that I just didn't understand. But for some reason, in the Mahabharata, I, I understood. When I saw a Rakshasa, I understood. But right now, seeing the Commandatore holding Don Giovanni's hand, and he's saying, see, si, and he's saying, no, 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 I just... <laughs> <laughs> I must just rapidly just pick up one word you say. I don't believe that a director's job is to say. This is a, a terrible misconception, as it's such a new science directing. It started with hundred years ago with some very strong personalities taking hold of a theatre they thought wasn't good, taking it in hand and having something to say. But today it's quite different. And I think that the autocratic idea, like in early Hollywood where the director had riding boots and the cap with an eye shield on it, that autocratic idea is gone. A director is not there to say. So that in those two works, what I tried to do was to re-look and re-listen to them and see what today seemed to me with the actors more important than something else, and that's what the work was. However, what unfortunately, and so I know, if you come and see me, I'll give you your money back. <laughs> the fact that you saw them I'm here accepting the fact of our times that one can't not record things. One can't not have videos. One can't not record something I'm talking into a microphone. But that goes against the understanding of what the living event is all about. So maybe it's of some use, maybe it isn't. I go along with it, but it isn't the same thing. So. I would only say to you, you should go and see them, but you can't because they're in the past. <laughs> we live here in a terrible conflict in Israel. On one hand, we, are believe, we believe in what you said about theater is listening to the other, listening to the other actor, listening to the audience, trying to really to get to the moments of truth. <coughs> On the other hand, around us, the not reality, but there are other things, terrible things that are happening and we are very confused about what is, or whether there should be something called as political theater because we are very confused and frustrated every day, so maybe we can get a little encouragement or advice from you, for somebody who comes from outside. <laughs> Thank you.
when you come from outside into something that is lived so intensely and so painfully on the spot, one has to be very careful of having easy opinions and giving good advice. Which at the same time, I think that you here need to be reminded constantly that this terrifying, tragic Palestinian-Israeli conflict is a world issue and that while nobody in the other parts of the world can dare say they can feel it with the suffering that's felt here in Palestinians and Israelis with all the terrible events that that produces the world needs to make everyone here recognize that because the world is concerned, the world doesn't accept easily and comfortably, which is why there are all sorts of gestures like this question of a boycott and all that. These are questions that have to be seen to be real because the reminder coming from someone less directly involved that something human is needed and that the people in charge are not necessarily as wise, as open, as tolerant, as understanding as we would like them to be. So that in all that confusion, we come back to what I tried to say at the opening, one must recognize that it's their business to tell us lies. And our business is to try for ourselves to shift and sift in this confusion to see what could be truer. At this moment we are doing a play from an African Sufi source about a very great Muslim, we could say almost a saint, except he was a very simple man living in a simple village with no contact with the outside world in colonial France, in colonial times in Africa. And the story of this man and the way that he was searching for what could be right attitude, right action led him to see that there are two easy options for human beings in any situation, easy or difficult. One is intolerance. That is perhaps the easiest attitude. And anybody who talks to a crowd and knows how to work up a crowd knows that to rise up in a human being, their capacity for intolerance is very easy. To do the opposite, which is to go from that to easy tolerance, what one can call in the old-fashioned use of the word liberal tolerance, saying, ah oh, yes, but let's just come around the table, work together, listen to the other person, and all will be well. That form of democratic tolerance is very, very easy indeed. But there is something beyond this, which is that I think we all need from one source or another endlessly to be reminded that true tolerance is the hardest, most uncompromising, most difficult, demanding attitude for any human being to reach. And that is what I'm afraid we must still recognize is that the present situation demands going beyond intolerance and easy tolerance to the most difficult tolerance of all, out of which can come a real understanding and a real exchange with other people.
to refer to the words before about the combination of the neurology science and the, the arts. Do you think a, a theater a scholars could anticipate it? Uh, could anticipate the emotions of the audience based on the science uh, that we know today of the neurology of the emotions? I think it was very dangerous. I think that one shouldn't, because what you open up is the whole area of manipulating. And I'm sure that, like cloning, this is one of the dangerous areas that we are going towards. In fact, oh, still a number of years ago, somebody came to see me who had developed a, a neurologist, in fact, a whole technique by which actors could breathe in different rhythms. And in breathing in different rhythms, they could artificially produce in themselves certain emotions. And this seemed of such horror that I beg the person not to go any farther in that direction. This is not simple opening of the human being. This isn't the human being human. This is the human being manipulating and being manipulated. Mr. Brooks, I have an Indian. I have read Mahabharata, the very version of one. <laughs> no, but, but having read and really absorbed much of Mahabharata, including the eternal song, the Bhagavad Gita, I must say, when I saw what you have done, you seem to catch the spirit of Bharata better than most Indians. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it was worth coming all the way just for this. <laughs> From a true Indian who's read the Mahabharata in the original. Well, wow. moment of silence. <laughs> I think I can reply directly in an indirect way. <laughs> we had in our international group, we had more, a bigger mixture of people than at any other time. I think we had something like 20 different races, cultures, backgrounds working together. And what we discovered very quickly, whether it was from the African, from the Japanese, from the European, from whichever source it was, was that each one found the Mahabharata not to be something uniquely Indian, but their own. And that's what enabled us to play it and bring it to other people, because India, I felt, has for a long time appropriated Shakespeare. And one thing one can say in favor of English culture is that it's been delighted that the world has seized Shakespeare. And nobody in England has said, this is just for us, don't dare touch at our sacred national author. No, Shakespeare has been recognized by the world as universal and by the English with great pleasure. And when I started working, it's not quite the same today, but when I started working, we recognized in English theater that Shakespeare was being done much better in Europe than we were doing it in England. This was a universal recognition. Now, when I came to study the Mahabharata, when I first read it, I was deeply touched by it and by the Bhagavad Gita, which I think is the center of all the deepest teaching that mankind can hear is in the Gita. I then discovered very quickly in going to India that this 
was something exclusive. This was not to be touched by non-Indians. This was ours. This was our myth. And when we found, on the contrary, that each one of the participants said, no, this is ours as well. We had a good reason for doing it. And in fact, our one moment of real fear was having made many journeys to India, having rehearsed for a long, long time, having made many experiments. We did, during rehearsals, what we often do, which was to go to a school, this we did in Paris, to a school not saying what we were going to do. So the kids came and sat around us, and we said, we're going to show you a rehearsal of the material we're working on at this moment, without any explanation whatsoever. And this, for us, was the moment of test. Could this material really mean something? Or was this a private vanity of ours? I think that we want to do it. And an hour later, after having done a first extract, we asked the children to talk in the way we're doing now. And they all immediately felt this was their story. So that's why we did it. <laughs> I beg somebody to ask me a question which I can give a quick answer. <laughs> but I think that I was once asked this question. I want to repeat a definition of acting I've made once because I think that it does contain all... And I can only say it in English because it doesn't translate into other languages. Somebody asked me, what does an actor need? And I said, both heart and art. And that in equal proportions. And this is where you'll find old actors who talk about technique of course this is necessary, but if that tips the balance towards expertise, the heart, and by heart you can really mean the spirit and the soul, disappear. If a young actor brings the deepest sincerity and hasn't got that <coughs> cold shower of, watch out, that is clumsy, that is excessive, all that is the technique of the moment. Because a technique is when you cut something with a knife, you put that exactly in the right place. That's what a technique is. And that means not only clean, clear feeling, but clear thinking. So that, those are qualities that don't are sometimes given immediately, but have to be developed. And the director is there to help the actor, to say, you're going too far, you're blinding yourself with your own excess of emotion. So you are feeling, you're crying, you're beating your breast, you're feeling I'm acting marvelously. And the uh, director is there to say, steady, steady, that's shit. <laughs> and the other way around. The actor who is so preoccupied by doing it well and getting applause and knowing how to get the laugh, you say, yes, but where's the meaning?
I want to uh, thank Mr. Peter Borg for talking, sharing with his thoughts with us. Thank you all for coming, and uh, 